You are listening to the Shepherd's Tent Message of the Week. We hope you enjoy this teaching from the family. I love what Jessica said, that may we not be those that are caught up in being revolutionaries, trying to come up with another cause. But this really is about the feet of Jesus. And when we choose the feet of Jesus, we choose the better part Jesus said that would not be taken from us. And movements come and go, causes come and go, but those who remain at the feet of Jesus, they are the ones that make history. You don't have to aim at making history. You just have to aim at his feet. And those who aim at his feet, they make history. It's the way it works. It's the way it goes. I want to talk to you tonight a little more about the grace awakening. And I, and I believe that what we experienced this morning was evidence of a grace awakening. And um, Holy Spirit's pouring out His Spirit upon us uh, today simply because He's good, but also because we believe that we belong in that place. <laughs> I'm going to say that again because I don't think you got what I said. I said, I believe that what happened... Things like what happened this morning happened because he's good. But I also believe that those things happen because we believe we belong in a place like that. Uh, We're no longer hindered by our own condemnation and shame and guilt. And so when the gate of glory opens up, rather than us being like the children of Israel under the Moses show, we don't go, oh, woe is me. We step in and go, no, this is where I belong. But I I really believe, and and this is evidence, again, the outpouring of the Spirit is evidence of a grace awakening. This is the place you and I belong. And for years, religion told us that we didn't deserve that. We couldn't couldn't step into that. Or we had to have everything perfect to have an atmosphere like that. And literally, most of us that came into the room, we, we were surprised by it. Because probably, if we're all being honest... We didn't do anything this week to prepare ourselves intentionally for a moment like that this morning. You know what that's called? Grace. Yeah. Pastor Mark, are you saying to me that I didn't pray enough this week? Probably. Are you saying that you didn't read enough scripture this week? Probably. And, and you know what the beautiful thing is? In all of our lack of preparation, you found out what Jessica was talking about. Yahweh's looking for a yield far more than preparation. And so this is evidence of the grace awakening. So I'm going to do a little review. 2010, I had a dream of me being in the back of an auditorium. And I saw two tables set up, two folding tables, and had boxes of books on top. And I went to the 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 boxes of books reached in and I pulled out a book. It was a white book with a red rose and on the top it said the grace awakening. So I woke up and did what every good Christian does when you have a dream like that. You Google stuff, right? That's the perfect, that's the new prophet's dictionary is Google. <laughs> and, um, and so I, I got onto Google and I, I typed in the grace awakening and sure enough, a white book came up with a red rose that said the Grace Awakening was actually written by Chuck Swindle. And um, to this day, I've never read that whole book. Um, <laughs> which is interesting. I'm, I'm reading it now. Um, I'm, reading, I'm, I'm actually going to finish it uh, this coming week. But I, for me, it, I did, in 2010, I didn't even know how to receive that word. In 2010, I was preparing for the Antichrist, not revival. In 2010, I had poor theology. I was a legalist. I was was bound in ministry performance. In 2010, I was just trying to hold it together so I could have an anointing to preach. In 2010, (laughs) 2010, I was just begging God to maybe answer a prayer to. And 2010, man, was, was wild. And I think back to the time of when I received this dream. I didn't know how to deal with what I was hearing. And so I read the first two chapters of that book and like almost threw it across the room. I was like, that's heretical. This stuff is heretical. This this book is basically a license to sin. This book is giving me permission to live however I want. And you can't have the anointing like that. And so I totally discarded the, the message I kept the book um, because I was a preacher. You got to keep your library full, you know. 
you, you know, you got to keep, keep the book count high in case you might need it. And, and I'll be the first one to tell you, I'm the guy that reads a book about four or five chapters and put it on the shelf and then wait for the Lord to lead me to read a few more, maybe in the future. I know none of y'all do anything like that, but that's just me. And so I wrestled with it. And then, of course, in 2015 and 16, we made the move to South Carolina. And that's when the Lord came and, I, and baptized me in the gospel and opened me up to this whole grace awakening on the inside. And so I have not preached on grace. I've declared grace. I've declared a grace awakening. I've even spoken that to you prophetically. But I felt like the Lord told me, um, as apostle began to declare the message of righteousness... Um, that it was t now that righteousness has been established in us, that now there were many people who were not ready for the grace awakening. Now they have permission to hear it. And so um, in that, the Holy Spirit said, now you have prophetically declared the grace awakening. Now I want you to teach the grace awakening. And, and the more that you and I, we're called to grow in grace, the more you and I grow in grace, the more you and I are going to realize who we are. And the more we realize who we are, the more we're going to instigate more outpouring. Oh man, I feel this so strong. And listen to what apostles' words have been for years. He said, many of the moves of the Spirit that are happening in this hour are, be, are primarily being led by teaching. Why? Because you and I are beginning to discover who we are. Why is that important? Because the more you and I know who we are, guess what unlock, What identity unlocks? Inheritance. And this is, oh man, this morning was your inheritance. This outpouring of the Spirit is your inheritance. The peace that you felt, the joy that you felt, the, the tears that, that fell down your cheeks, these are your inheritances. Your children running, laughing, playing, enjoying the presence of God. This is your inheritance. You getting healing released to you, that's your inheritance. You getting your hope back again. Some of you may have not gotten healed this morning, but now you have hope that it's on the way. Let me, and let me tell you guys something. There's a difference between healing and a miracle. And just because you didn't get a miracle this morning doesn't mean the healing didn't start. The way I've heard it, Dr. T.L. Lowry used to say this back in the day. He would say, this healing that has started in you, it's like a shot of penicillin. And he said, it's gotten into your body. It's just now hitting your bloodstream. And you may not know it yet, but the healing process has already begun. And I want to tell you today, like, your healing process has begun. While we were praying, I saw Mark Gendrick. I saw lung, D, the DNA of his lungs, the cells of his lungs, starting to recreate themselves. I started watching as we were praying. Oh, hallelujah. For Daryl today, I started seeing new cells and tissues of his heart and scarring. I started seeing it be removed and new cells begin to regenerate. I'm telling you today, we have experienced a resurrection. And it's not a theoretical resurrection. It's a literal resurrection. I think sometimes when we hear the term resurrection, we think of it theoretical or that I'm talking mentally or, or some kind of spiritual thing. But I'm telling you, I'm talking about a resurrection that impacts your DNA. That today, the creator who put the DNA in your ancestors' ancestors got in there and started impacting your storyline. Got in there and said, oh, okay, I know that this was hereditary, but we ended that today. That kind of rewriting your story. And so today, I believe in this, this time, we're in a grace awakening. We're experiencing a resurrection. And so, oh man. Apostle texted me a few days ago and he said, he's, he was texting me and another son. And he said, listen, he said, uh, this thing's getting serious down here in Mobile. And I'm asking you to just join me in prayer about this. And if you guys hear anything you know, let me know. And so I, as he's texting me this, I'm walking out of my office to go take my walk. So I walk around the city and uh, they don't know it yet, but I'm praying in tongues all over the city and walking past and I, I'm, I'm, I'm faith movement, movement all over this place, man. Everywhere the sole of my foot treads, I've claimed houses for you all. I've claimed buildings for us. I've 
You know, I'm taking over the city day by day, walking it. And so I'm walking, and I, or I'm getting ready to leave as that text comes. I step out the door, and I get about five minutes into my walk. And I remember one of the first prophetic words that Apostle gave to us in South Carolina for that move of the Spirit there was that in this move of the Spirit, identity would be paramount. Identity would be paramount. It would be the primary thing, which then we get deeper into that move of the Spirit. And guess what comes out of that? The revelation of beloved identity. And, and now we understand we are the beloved. God, Abba, He's what? He's good. And we are beloved, right? And these two primary revelations are what builds cultures like what you and I are living in today. And it's a beautiful thing, man. So beloved identity just began to spring forth in the move of the Spirit. And this is what the Lord said. Because we've been faithful to make identity paramount, now He said, I'm going to make inheritance paramount. Yeah. Whoo! I felt the Holy Ghost. I'm sh I was walking past the fire department over there, and I'm sure they got the hose out because I was like, I'm like fired up. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I can't help it. I'm one of those shake and quake and huck and buck kind of guys, and I, I don't do that a lot around y'all because I'd freak some of y'all out, but that's how I am. And I got fired up when the, when the Lord says, I'm about to make, or I'm making your, the inheritance paramount, which again, I'm not going to hand my 13 year old the keys to a Ferrari tomorrow, right? I'm not going to, I, I, and I'm probably not going to do it at 16 just because he has a driver's license. I'm prophesying that I'm going to have money to get a Ferrari by the time he's 16. Hallelujah to Jesus. Um, so there's, there's, there's a little bit of a, an agenda in there. Lord, I'm not going to hand him the keys, but I'm going to have the money to buy it if I need to. But <laughs> no, but I'm not handing him the keys to that. Why? Because he's not he's not mature enough yet to handle that. So so if inheritance is connected to maturity, you and I are past perfection. We're perfect. You and I are not worried about being perfect because you and I now have a perfect relationship with God. How do you improve on looking like Jesus? Oh, I need somebody. I'm about to go over there and see if they'll help me shout. Okay? Because they're shouting over there. <laughs> Can you hear them? <laughs> you know, I'm, not, I'm not talking about you and I reaching perfection. We've already been made perfect. So you can't improve upon Jesus. When I step into the secret place, I don't rehearse all of my sins that week because when I get in there, the father would be like, what are you talking about? He said, when you walked in the room, I saw my son. Oh, how would this change how you pray if you stop going, on, going in there as you? How would prayer start? How would your prayer life be impacted if you stopped showing up like a sinner saved by grace? How would your prayer life look like if you went in and said, no, I am the righteousness of God. And when he looks in my eyes, he can't find sin. He sees the same fire that's in the, oh, hallelujah, the eyes of his son, because I am in the image and likeness of Jesus. So when I go into the secret place, I don't go in in my name. I go in his. Oh, Father, thank you. I feel this in my, I'm going to have a little Pentecostal preaching meltdown here for a second. I feel it. I feel it so strongly. What has this presence come to announce to us today? Grace, resurrection, life, abundant life, Zoe, God kind of life. We're never going back to the way it used to be. And so how so so I'm not talking about perfection tonight, but I am talking about maturity. And how do you and I mature? We don't mature by getting it together. We mature by discovering who we are. And so that's why we got to just throw the pedal, put the pedal to the metal and accelerate as fast as we can, not in trying to figure out perfection, but in figuring out who you and I are. And the more you and I discover who we are, the more we get trusted with keys. You guys are trying to figure out how to get keys 
through strategy in the soulish realm. And what I'm telling you is you are going to have the hardest time trying to get to certain things through your mind when the only way you're going to inherit it is not by reading the book of Proverbs every day. I know you think that you're going to get wisdom from, from reading one proverb a day. One proverb a day keeps stupid away, right? Uh, I, I know you guys think that's what I'm talking about. That's great. That's good. That's a good place to start. But where your wisdom is going to come from, where your knowledge is going to come from, where your understanding is going to come from, is not because you can quote scripture. It's going to come when you believe that you, when you speak, Jesus' authority is on what you say. So what you're trying to get to in a soulish way, the way religion taught you to get to things, it's not going to work. Grace has come to awaken us to the reality that there is no difference between me and Jesus. And the deeper that I can go in this understanding of John 17, I am in the Father and He is in me. I am in you and you are in me. And now we're back in the, man, I'm rhyming, in the Trinity. Oh, hallelujah to Jesus. It's flowing. Watch out, LD. I'm coming to your house to record tonight, son. I'm coming. Shondo. <laughs> the more you, I just feel happy, man. I feel happy in God. Do you feel that? And it's like, man, we get caught back up in this place of the Trinity. And oh, thank you, Jesus. So, and that, and the deeper we go in this understanding of who you and I are, guess what? Inheritance starts to be unlocked because now he can trust you with inheritance. The reason why he, does, he doesn't withhold inheritance from us to hurt us, but he trusts us with inheritance when he knows you're thinking more like his son than you. Because we've been indoctrinated. And the renewing of the mind is not just a repentance of sin. The renewing of the mind is getting you in the same wavelength with Jesus. Right? So when he unlocks the inheritance, you don't do the American dream thing. You do the kingdom thing. Amen. Hallelujah. So... <laughs> I'm not talking to you about let's get perfect so that we can get more. I'm saying let's get mature so that we can release inheritance all over the earth. Okay, so this grace awakening. <laughs> I believe that what we're called to do in this house is help rescue some language that... And understanding of language that has been perverted by toxic legalistic revival cultures. You ready? You ready for this? Revive, legalistic revival is starting to get popular again. You are considered a good soldier of Jesus Christ nowadays if you can be a good armchair quarterback picking apart everybody else's ministry and things. From a, from a social media post. <laughs> and so legalistic, toxic revival culture now has come into the body of Christ, especially in the West. And legalism has now taken the term grace and considered it greasy grace. So, so the first thing you got to do to make something sound bad is you got to have an adjective attached to it. So the greatest way that we could get people scared of grace is that we need to tell people it's greasy grace or it's cheap grace or convenient grace or 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 now that now that Mark's preaching the Abba revelation they're doing the sloppy agape stuff over there at the shepherd's tent. So we, we, we take terms and we start saying things like greasy grace because that makes people scared. And, and what I actually believe is you always called a company of people like you and I to redeem those words and make grace amazing again. Gonna, 
Oh man, I feel it so strong. It's going to be it's going to be said in this generation that amazing grace has been redeemed. And I feel this, man. We've got to redeem this greasy grace and make it amazing again. And can I tell you, it's time for the West to hear the radical preaching of grace. Because our legalism hasn't worked. I've said this before. The greatest force fueling sin in our nation is not what you and I think it is. It's the pulpit obsessed with legalism. What's fueling sin in our nation is pulpits that are hell-bent on preaching a God that is non-existent in the Bible. It's hell-bent on making people feel less than, talking about their sin issues, and obsessed with legalism. It's nothing more than Moses' news, but it's not the good news. You say, how could you say something like that? Because Paul said, the strength of sin is the law. And you, some people still think that the way we're going to turn the nation around is by putting the Ten Commandments in every courthouse in America. i got news for you. The more the Ten Commandments get revived, the strength of sin is going to increase in our nation. That's what Paul said. The strength of sin is the law. So what is the answer, guys? We've tried legalism. We've tried the law. We've tried to preach hard rituals, rules, traditions, and it's not made our nation better. Why not yield to the gospel? Why not yield to the Bible that calls it the gospel of grace? Because grace has an empowering, oh, hallelujah, spirit to it. Grace is God. Grace is light, and you can't get righteousness, you can't get saved, you can't have peace or joy or any of those things if you and I don't have grace. You say it the way I feel it. It ain't going to work. It's not going to work apart from grace, and we've tried everything. So I'm going to ask you, Again, this is what I heard this morning when the, I'm weeping, I'm crying, and God's moving all over the room, and I'm seeing so many things, and I hear the Lord speak that Galatians 3 passage in my spirit, and he says, oh man, he said, how the, this lavish supply of the spirit and the miracles you see released, he said, how is that happening? Because you kept the law? Or is it because of the hearing of faith? And I'm telling you, what happened in this room today, it was grace, and it was grace partnered with, I believe he's in the room. Yeah. Apostle said this for years, and it makes more and more sense as I go further into this relationship with Jesus. He said, beware of any place that said they did something to make him come. Anybody that can boast in their works and he showed up, stay away. I'm telling you, he did not come this morning because you've been Mother Teresa all this week. He did not show up this morning because you fasted and prayed enough. He showed up because he's good, and you and I are starting to believe we are too. So this microphone. I'm telling you, if deep calls unto deep, then good calls unto good. <laughs> If deep calls unto deep, then righteousness starts mingling with righteousness. If, if deep calls unto deep, then grace starts speaking to grace. Oh. So, if we felt his goodness, it's because he was attracted to himself. Well, when we get into Hebrews, you're going to find out that what Jesus is doing in you is not even guaranteed by you. You're going <laughs> to... You're going to find, when we get into the book of Hebrews and I start teaching you grace from the book of Hebrews, some of y'all are going to either struggle or you're going to have a Pentecostal fit. You're going to actually dance for the first time because you're going to find out your salvation has nothing to do with you. Jesus is the guarantee of a promise that his father made to himself. Let me run that back and say it one more time because it just feels good. Jesus is the guarantee of you and I's salvation based upon a promise that God made to himself. <laughs> Which means you didn't initiate your salvation and nor do you maintain it. Because this, oh, this is the Bible. Because you didn't initiate. He did. 
If you had any kind of point in time where you are awakened to him, it's because he did it. And Jesus is the guarantee of the Father's promise to himself. And you ready for this? God made a promise to himself that your salvation would be totally secure. Whose Disney cup is this? My God, I'm about to sling it across the room. (laughs) This is just good, man. This this is what I mean by the good news. When you start talking about this stuff, you start smiling. When you start talking about this stuff, you you feel stuff coming uh, alive on the inside. Why? Because I'm talking about your original intent. I'm talking about who you really are, not who you think you are. I'm, I'm getting to the, oh, thank you, Jesus. The stuff that you and God were talking about before you thought you were separated from him. Jesus has guaranteed your salvation and the father made a promise to himself because he's not a God that he could even lie. But because God could find nothing higher than himself, he guaranteed to himself, Olivia's going to be the righteousness of God. He guaranteed to himself, Tyler's going to be the righteousness of God. He guaranteed to himself, there's no way they'll go to hell because they belong to me. Oh, my God. Mark, you got to be careful with this grace message. You're going too far in this. you got to be careful. You're going to give people a license to sin. You didn't need a license to. You do it. (laughs) Here's your sinning card. Now go have your way. Here's the beautiful thing. This is what I love. People, People struggle in sin because their mind's still being transformed. And when they struggle in sin, they... (laughs) Oh, man, I'm going to get in trouble. But here we go. They struggle in sin and immediately they're like, Pastor Mark, I'm screwing it up. I'm messing up and, and they're so scared they're going to mess something up or going to do something. And here's my first question to them when I, when I start. Again, now it's one thing to mess up, screw up. It's another thing for you to willfully do something. Okay? But here's what I want to say to you. When I, when I talk to people initially about sin, I ask them, did you like it? Now, if it's sexual, I'm not going to ask you if you liked it in the moment. That's a stupid question. I'm saying when it's over with, did you, did you, did, was the result of it, was, there, was it fruitful? And every time, no one who's actually going after God ever told me, yeah, it was awesome. No, the moment it was over, shame, guilt, condemnation moved in. Can, can I tell you something? <laughs> because you didn't like it is further proof you're a slave to righteousness. Oh, 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 oh. oh, I'm helping somebody today. You're, you not liking sin is one of the first proofs. It's an immature proof, but it's a proof that you are no longer bound to sin because there's something in you that says, that's not right. That's not who I am. I'm better than that. I'm, I'm saying, be honest. And, and, and here's what I say to people. Either way, you're proving that you belong to God. People are like, oh my God, you're going to give people licenses. I never had to give somebody a license. I don't know of a DMV anywhere. They'll give you a license for it, but you didn't need it because you did it. You're going to do it. If you want to do it, you're going to do it. So grace doesn't come and actually give you a license to sin. Grace gives you the ability to believe you're better than that. Grace gives you the ability to say, that's not even who I am. And grace is not a license to sin. Grace is for you to be awakened to the fact it's been removed. <laughs> I said this to you last week, I think it was, when the Bible talks about, uh, or, or when the Bible talks about grace, many people call it cheap grace. And my question is, <laughs> cheap for who? Because it certainly wasn't cheap for Jesus. It cost him everything for you and I to experience grace. So how could I exhaust grace when it costs Jesus everything? So I refuse to allow legalistic people that don't know Jesus, that like to keep people in church in bondage. I refuse to let them steal this term. It's not cheap grace. It's not greasy grace. It's amazing grace. And I'm telling you, if you want to know what this church believes about grace, we're hyper grace. 
What is biblical grace? Anybody remember some of this from last week? Anybody? Okay. Making sure some of you pay attention. They say you have to say something like seven, seven times. So here's the next few Sundays right here. Ready? <laughs> Romans 5.20, when it describes God's grace, the Greek word is hyperperusian. The very beginning of that word is hyper. <laughs> when explaining the grace of God, it is hyperperusian. And that means God's grace overabounded. Okay? Ephesians 2 7, the word is hyperbalon. It means God's grace surpasses and exceeds expectations. 1 Timothy 1 14, hyperplanazin means God's grace was surpassing in abundance. Every time the term grace was used in these verses, it was used with the... Oh, thank you, Jesus. The beginning of the Greek word was hyper. And people are like, you better be careful with hyper grace. And okay, who's going to warn Paul? Because he's the apostle that started teaching us this. He's the one that told Timothy, grace, it overabounds. He tells the Romans that God's grace overabounds. He tells the church in Ephesus, God's grace, it's going to exceed all of your wildest expectations. So, let me ask you something. If Paul described grace in a hyper way, why why are you and I backing down from it? You're going to let a bunch of legalistic Pentecostals Talk you out of a biblical message? Ask them, where's the fruit of their legalism? If they're really a Jesus people, they'll have things in their life like love, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. How about this one? Self-control. And they want to get mad at people for not having self-control and alcohol. And I'm saying, do you have self-control with your tongue? And you think one sin's worse than you gossiping and slandering another believer? (laughs) Amen. See, the old preacher would say, amen or oh me. But when, (laughs) when we hear the term grace, we should absolutely preach hyper grace. Let me ask you a question. How can you exhaust the grace of God? So, let me ask you something. Why should we underemphasize grace when the Bible overemphasizes it? You and I need to become experts in the grace of God. You and I need to get deep in our understanding of the grace of God. And and can I tell you, you're going to need grace and understanding of grace because legalists, they're lawyers. And they can argue as good as anybody. Remember, John Calvin was a lawyer. And can I remind you, the only person that most represents a lawyer in the Bible, he's called the accuser of the brethren. It's just true, man. It's just true. Legal, legalist, they will constantly pick you apart. They're constantly trying to kill your joy. They're constantly trying to make you wrong. Can I tell you? Legalist is what... It's legalist who I believe <laughs> created the phrase, misery loves company. And you know what? They're not attacking you Because of you, they just want somebody to feel as bad as they do. Amen. That's all I'm going to say about that. I'm going to force gump that and just walk on. 1 Peter 5.10 says this, God is the God of all grace. John 1.14 says that Jesus is full of grace. 1 Peter 1.10 tells us, That the Old Testament prophets, they prophesied about the grace that you and I have today. 2 Peter 1-2 tells us that grace is multiplied in the knowledge of Jesus. 
Okay, Hebrews 12, 15 tells us it's important not to miss the grace of God and that it's good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace. Okay, Acts 20, 24, Galatians 1, 6, the gospel is described as the gospel of grace. Paul and Barnabas in Acts 13, 43, they urged the converts there in Antioch. They urged them to continue in God's grace. Romans 5, 21, Romans 6, 1, the Bible says that where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. So the next time that people remind you how dark the world is, tell them how much grace is available. That's why I said you and I have to get seraphim eyes. Isaiah 6, seraphim, in the old covenant, when Israel was apostate and didn't even listen to their own prophets, Isaiah had an encounter where seraphim came in the room and they looked at Isaiah in the midst of great darkness and they said, the whole earth is filled with the glory of the Lord. I'm telling you, darkness has never won one time in any generation. If it won, it's because you and I failed to see the grace that was available for the moment. (laughs) I'm almost finished here, I think. Ephesians 2 verses 5 and 8 says we're saved by grace. Romans 5 2 says stand in grace. John 1 16 says we receive grace upon grace. I'm reviewing. This This is stuff from last week too. Romans 5.15 says that the grace of God overflows to us. Oh, I love this. Titus chapter 2 verse 11 through 13 tells us that grace doesn't just bring us salvation, but grace teaches us to reject sin, and it's the only way you and I can ever walk in godliness. Grace makes you godly. You know what? Oh, I, I, I got to back up here. Legalism, being like the accuser of the brethren. You ready? Legalists have the same argument that the serpent had with Eve. If you do what we say, you'll be like God. The problem is you, because of Jesus, are already like God. Uh, Man, I'm telling you, we're back. Oh, man, if this argument doesn't prove we're back in the garden already, I don't know what does. Some of you still think we're not in the garden. When Je- Oh, Jesus, help me. When Jesus shed his blood, kicked the end out of the tomb, he started the garden project back again. And you and I now have been brought back to the garden, and you and I are here to expand that garden. And guess what? In this covenant, the only trick the enemy has is the same trick prior to the fall, because we're not falling anymore. If the enemy is using that lie, it's good evidence to you and I. We're back in the garden. Because their argument is this. If you do what I say. You ready? If you, Okay. What do legalists do? They give you rules of do and do nots. What do you think the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is? It's the knowledge of good. And of evil. And some of you think knowledge, there's a knowledge that is good. And so legalists love to think of knowledge in terms of it being good knowledge. And they say, if you eat of this tree of understanding this is what you do and this is what you don't do, you'll be like God. And I'm I'm telling you, it's time for you to quit Picking between good and bad knowledge. And it's time for you to go eat from the right tree. Jesus. Which is why I said the word for this year is Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Why? Because 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this. You and I now with unveiled faces are beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. What's the glory of the Lord? Jesus. We're looking into the mirror of Jesus and you and I are being transformed into that same image with ever increasing glory. And Jesus is not scared for you to be more glorious than him. Because he said, if you believe in me, the works that I do shall you do also and greater. It's an insult to Jesus to think you wouldn't do more. Go to Boone County, West Virginia. My dad set up a tent. I was, a, I was about seven years old. 
set up a tent, six, seven years old, set up a tent, probably, probably 200 people, 300 people that lived in that whole surrounding area. 150 people got born again in a week. We go out to do a baptism in February in the Little Coal River. You can look all this up. It's for real. You can search all this stuff. Google it. That's what you prophetic people do. So it's all real. And my dad and his elders cracked the ice so that they could, they were doing ice baths before they were cool. And they were out there cracking ice to get people because people were demanding to be baptized. They wanted to be baptized. And we're out there doing baptisms. And there's a woman by the name of Amy Belcher. And she gets so excited about being baptized. I watched this as a six, seven-year-old kid. She began to shout because of what Jesus had done. He not only saved Amy, but saved her husband, brought her husband home, their marriage restored. God was doing amazing things in this family during this revival. And she got so excited about what the Lord was doing, she started dancing, and she literally danced on top of the water. And when she came to herself and saw herself standing above my father and his elders, she looked down and slowly sank back into the water. Don't you tell me he can't do it. I've seen it, man. I've seen it, and it's going to get weirder and weirder. You think the colors are weird. Wait till you wave your hands and a banner comes. Grace, grace, grace. It's amazing grace. We're being awakened to grace. Grace is, is the gospel. It's the gospel of grace. And grace is the empowerment of the real you. You hear me? Grace is the empowerment of the real you. And I'm telling you, the assignment on this house, what God is, is adamant about doing here is making sure you and I know who the real us are. Who, who am I for real? And I'm telling you, you're not a struggling sinner. You're a saint with a perfect relationship with God and nothing is impossible to them that believe. That's who you are. Who you are. Romans 6, verse 6. Listen to this. Could it be any clearer... This is Romans 6, verse 6. That our former identity is now and forever deprived of its power. For you and I were co-crucified with Him to dismantle the stronghold of sin within us. So that we would not continue to live one moment longer submitted to sin's power. Listen, what has grace come to do? I'm going to finish with this. To deliver you of the duality of your former nature. You are not a sinner and a saint. You don't have a sin nature in you and a spirit nature in you. <laughs> Romans 6 verse 6 says, You as a new creation believer only have one nature. And it's your godlike nature. And as long as religion can... The, the only way religion can thrive in your heart is for you to believe you're still both. It tells you you're going to struggle the rest of your life, brother, trying to overcome those fleshly desires and temptations of the flesh. You've got to continually put that old man to death. You heard that? I love it. I've said this to you before, but it's so funny. The way I was a disciple growing up is when you'd have an encounter with God, people would come around you and say, now you're on the devil's radar now. Get ready, because if you hadn't been tempted, oh, now you're going to. It's like, what? What? <laughs> I thought I got more of God. So apparently, the more God you get, the less protection you have. Yeah. <laughs> tell me, please tell me. Oh, here we go. Spiritual warfare. Here we go. Tell me how when you ascend in matters of importance in our government... With each elevation of your position of identity in the United States government comes more detailed security. You think that that idea just came out of nowhere? All wisdom originates from the kingdom. So as you're elevated in identity, you get less protection in the kingdom? No, I'm telling you, some of you, the more you find out who you are, the more elevated your detail becomes. <laughs> oh, man, you'll finally come out of religion telling you, well, everybody's just got one angel. Have you seen mine? Come 
Come on, man. Are you ready? One unknown angel cast Satan into the lake of fire. It wasn't even Michael. It's one unknown angel. It might be mine. Mark, wait one second. Hoppa! Mm. I, I mean, it's an unknown angel. It's not even, it doesn't even say it's an archangel. It doesn't say it's a seraphim. It gives it no class, no rank, just one angel. And you and I think that when we have an encounter with God, we get less protection, and now we should be nervous that the devil's going to get us? That's how they discipled us. The more Jesus you got, the more problems you're going to have. And I'm here to tell you, that's the biggest lie. Because they got it all wrong, friend. They got the rapture wrong. I just threw that in there. They got the rapture wrong. <laughs> they, they got it all wrong. They got it all wrong. They got it all wrong. Because he that be in Christ is a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. In the song of Solomon, Solomon saw a place in God that when the bride and the bridegroom got together, they got caught up in one of his cherubim to enjoy their intimacy. And you ready? And while they're enjoying intimacy, angels are standing at guard to push back every demonic spirit that would distract you from intimacy. And if Solomon in the old covenant could peer in and see angelic protection so that you could enjoy intimacy, how much greater intimacy do we now have by the blood of Jesus filled with the spirit and protected by the angelic? You and I don't need to worry about devils. Devils are scared. You're going to find out who you are. They're nervous because the only reason they have a playground in your mind is because you don't know who you are. But if you ever find out that you're the righteousness of God, they will have no playground to play on. I feel it so strong, man. I feel it so strong. The enemy works in the darkness. Darkness is a lack of knowledge. A lack of knowledge in what? Identity. The prophet Hosea said God's people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Knowledge about what? Who you are. Guys, we got to quit letting legalists disciple us and tell us, now that you've had an experience with God, guess what? Since Sunday morning, Jezebel's going to be looking for you. She can't find me. I'm hidden under the shadow of the Almighty. Come on, man. Come on. Come on. Are you getting this? <laughs> okay, two of you. Praise God. We have taken hours in the life of Jesus and turned it into the whole lifestyle of the believer. Jesus spent 33 and a half years on the planet not showing us how to die, teaching us how to live. You don't get to take six hours of the life of Jesus and make it the whole of our lives. Don't get to do it. Don't get to do it. <laughs> so I'm going to read the legalist favorite verse to quote to you and I to keep us in bondage. And then I'm going to read the next passage that they don't want you and I to read. Because if we read that part, then they won't have anything for us. Ready? Galatians 2.20. <laughs> Maybe I should quote it to you in the King James because it sounds more like... Deadly. <laughs> I've been crucified with Christ. Here's King James Version. It's no longer I who live. I feel like saying it like TL. It's no longer I who lives. <laughs> but it's Christ that lives within me. <laughs> I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who lives. But it's Christ that lives in me. And the life that I now live. I live through the faith of the Son of God. Okay. Now let's read in the Passion. My old identity has been co-crucified with the Messiah and no longer lives. Listen to this. For the nails of his cross crucified me with him. Listen, look at me real quick. Where are you on Calvary? Religion told you you were the thief. No, you weren't. You were Jesus. You were not the thief. You were in mystical union at the cross. You were in Him on the cross. He died your death. Which means... Say it again. 
That's it. Oh, bingo. He died a death that religion still makes you try to do daily. Oh my God. Get the axe out and just start chopping at the tree. The nails of his cross crucified me with him. And now the essence of this no, new life is no longer mine. For the anointed one lives his life through me. We live it in union as one. You know what? Some of you that have gotten the perverted gospel of dying to self. You are not crucifying you. You're crucifying him again. Again, religion never likes to read verses in context. When Paul said, I die daily, he was talking about persecution. Not trying to bring his flesh, flesh under subjection to the spirit. Because that would disagree with Paul's theology. Paul already believed he was dead. Paul wasn't teaching you die daily. Paul was saying, when you go preach this gospel in this generation, you put your life on the line for this. And each day he was, he was putting his life on the line to preach this gospel. I'm telling you, some of you are trying to crucify the one who's trying to come alive in you. We live in union as one. My new life is empowered by the faith of the Son of God who loves me so much that he gave himself for me and dispenses his life into mine. That is why I don't view God's grace as something minor or peripheral. For if keeping the law could release God's righteousness to us, the anointed one would have died for nothing. That's where you shout right there. You shout because grace is not a minor word. Grace is not greasy. It's not cheap. It's not something that you should preach every once in a while. Come on, Pentecostals would preach 80% law, 20% grace to get people to answer the altar call. I'm telling you, you'll quit having altar calls if you'll preach 100% grace because there'll be no sin left to preach about. Only reason why you have to preach sin in a church anymore is because you've given them the law. You've strengthened sin. People say, Mark, you just don't do altar calls like you used to. I said, I don't have to. I've got a bunch of righteous people around me. I got a bunch of people that believe they're perfect. And you know what's amazing about you and I believing that we're perfect is when we screw up, we own it much faster. Because we know that's not who we really are. Preach. We, we have to preach against sin because we've constantly empowered sin by the law. You preach 100% grace and you quit treating it like it's minor and peripheral. And you'll on, on, all of a sudden have a group of people that believe they're the righteousness of God. And they'll start rising up in their identity. And guess what happens when you know who you are? Here comes inheritance. And I'm telling you, some of you are trying to get to inheritance outside of identity and it's illegal. You're only frustrating yourself. So do me a favor. Stop going to Babylon to find out all the business strategies to get wealth. Find out who you are and everything you need will come to you. Show me where a king goes out and finds his own wealth. Can I, can I teach you one more thing? All right, good. I got a little more than four that time, so I know I got, can do this. You ready? You ready? Citizens in a kingdom don't fight. They have their own designated army for that. You know who the army is in the kingdom? The angels. They fight devils. You don't. Show me where Daniel fought the prince of Persia. He prayed to God. You know what Daniel's warfare was? Reminding God of what he said through the prophet Jeremiah. Caleb said I could come on, so I'm going to come on a little bit deeper in that. Listen to me. Daniel didn't fight devils. And we built a whole theology off of his fast. He didn't even mean to fast for 21 days. I'm serious. We've made a whole that religion. We find the formula, work the formula. Now, everybody at the, just recently broke a fast that they should have never done because Jensen Franklin made it popular. 
I love Jensen, but my God, I'm not joining you on the 21 days Daniel diet. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm not, I'm not following for I love Jensen, by the way. Don't I'm not doing the formula. I'm not doing the formula because Daniel said he fasted until it just so happened that 21 days later, the angel showed up, but the angel didn't show up and say, now, Daniel, you better sharpen that sword and get ready to swing at the prince of Persia. He said, I came from the very moment you started calling God's name. And we got here and we got into a battle and found out we needed Michael, but Michael took care of the prince of Persia. Now, let me give you the message you've been trying to hear. Nowhere was there warfare instructions. You and I, as we grow in who we are, will stop entertaining sin, will stop entertaining demonic activity, and we're just going to enjoy intimacy and inheritance. Thank you for listening to the message of the week. If you would like to partner with the podcast or find out more information about The Shepherd's Tent, please visit us at theshepherdstent.com.